So the purpose of, of today's presentation is really um, uh, a, an introduction, or you could say a refresh, on the principles under the, um, the Data Protection Act. Um, and as I'm sure everyone knows, because the new regulations are coming in on the 25th of May, GDPR, which stands for the General Data Protection Regulation, um, what I propose to do is to touch on a few of the changes in brief as we go through these slides. There is, however, a, a second presentation in a couple of weeks, which goes into more detail specifically on GDPR, which of course I'll be looked, uh, delighted if anyone wants to join, and um, <clears throat> details of which will be circulated um, um, after the uh, after after today's presentation. So, as a refresh, um, what the DPA does, and GDPR is no different here, is protects personal data. Um, personal data has to be data which is either stored electronically, which of course this in this day and age is. Um, probably not accounts for 90% of, of all data concerning an individual. Um, can it equally apply to paper systems? So manual records, um, the rules also capture those, provided the information that's in paper form is kept in some sort of a filing system. So an example is if um, a member of staff has a post-it note on the desk and it contains someone's email address or a phone number. That in itself is not personal data because it's a piece of paper on a desk. However, if a number of um, such papers were put together and stored somewhere, which means that someone could readily go and find them, then it would be considered to be personal data and would be captured under the, uh, under the Act. So the activities which um, the Act captures is any processing of data. And processing is so broadly defined that it essentially means anything. You can see in the second bullet point, it's um, any operation that's carried out on data. And so in simple terms, that means when you collect it, um, so just collecting data, storing it, even if, if you, even if you don't do nothing with it, it's processing. Um, and um, at the other end of the, of the chain, if you like, um, if you disclose personal data, which means you either send it um, or you disclose it perhaps just um, over the phone by, by um, orally, then that's also um, processing. So um, the, the simple thing to bear in mind is essentially anything you do with personal data uh, will be processing. And so processing is, is not strictly, um, it, it's not limited to what a data processor does, um, but it's any, any operation. We'll come, we'll come on to data processor uh, and what that means in, in a moment. The third bullet point, um, there's, very, there's, there's lots of very useful information on the ICO website. The ICO, the Information Commissioner, is the regulator, and as well as enforcing the rules, they're, 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 um, they do quite a good job of providing a lot of guidance. So I do recommend going to the ICO website um, with any queries that you have uh, in your day-to-day -day business. Or, of course, feel free to contact um, Harper James, and we'd be happy to help. So what is personal data? This is sometimes confused. Some people think that personal data has to be simply something which relates to um, someone's contact details, for example. Um, and the simple fact is that it's any information that either does or potentially w or could identify a living person. And it's either from the information alone, so you have someone's name and email address and uh, address, which clearly identifies the individual um, from that information alone. Or if you've got one piece of data which on its own would not identify an individual, you might just have a phone number and nothing else. If that, can, if that can, can be combined with other information, which the data controller has, say, uh, on another system, um, or even if they don't have it, if the data controller might at some point get hold of another piece of information, which by cross-referencing those two bits of information would identify an individual, then the um, personal data, so the example of just, ha just having a phone number, uh, that, that would be personal data because it's possible to cross-reference it with other data in the future. Uh, GDPR doesn't really make any changes here. It, it, it the only change is that it's not limited to whether the information um, is likely to come into the data controller's hands, but it actually looks at if the information um, essentially could come from anywhere. So if you've got an employee who put their mind to it, who was determined to, tr to try and work out whose phone number that was. The, um, the, the, the rule or the test really is whether if that person put their mind to it, um, could they, would it be reasonably likely that they could find another piece of data from anywhere? Um, 
and cross refer the two and if the answer is yes then the phone number on its own is personal data so a very cautious approach is what's advised because frankly um as you can see it's pretty pretty much anything can be considered to be personal data um the bullet points the, the last uh, three bullet points um some people again make the um uh, wrong conclusion that it has to be um, something which is identifies where somebody lives. The fact is, if you know who the data relates to, even if you don't know their address, then um, an opinion expressed about someone. So, for example, you know, notes from a, me a meeting where somebody gives an opinion about an individual, that's personal data. Um, any indications of the intentions of the controller. So, for example, um, an HR meeting where perhaps um, um, HR have indicated um, that they might take some sort of action against an employee, that's personal data. And in broad terms, essentially anything which describes um, someone's biography. So, for example, uh, online tracking data, which tells you where an individual's been. It tells you which web page they've visited. That's all personal data. Is there really anything at all which, um, which tells you something about what someone's been doing and not simply where they, uh, where they live or where they work? The last bullet point is very important because personal data um, because it has to identify someone, of course, it doesn't apply to anonymized data. Um, so the DPA and also GDPR um, are very clear to say that if it's at all possible for you to conduct your business um, with data that can be anonymized, then you should do so. There's no reason to keep data in a personally identifiable form if you can achieve the same purpose through anonymizing the data. Um, GDPR brings in another concept called pseudonymization, which is a bit like anonymization light. Pseudonymization means that if you have um, a set of data about someone, um, so it has the, perhaps someone's name, their address, their phone number, um, where they, uh, which websites they visited and so forth. If you were to break that one document into several documents, and you were to put one piece of information on one document and another piece on another document. So say you end up with four different documents or data sets, we call them. If those documents are then kept somewhere wholly separately from each other, so that the um, information security, for example, isn't it means that it's not possible for you to easily take document A um, and match it with document B, then of course those documents individually don't, don't identify someone, so they become pseudonymized. What you find then is, is that for the, for the control of data, at some point they want to then re-identify that person, they want to put together those data sets, then, then the way that that would ordinarily happen is that you would have a, um, a scrambled number, a code, as it were, on each document. And that particular scrambled code you know from the data set A, if it matches the scrambled code on the data set B, those two documents belong together. And so you then put them back together and you've got... Um, re-identified information on an individual. So something you, you may come across is, again, that's another um, technique that can be used. And if you do keep data in those forms, anonymized or pseudonymized, then um, whilst they're in those forms, then they're not covered by the, the rules because they're not strictly personal data. So in addition to the data we've been discussing, which as you can see is very broad and captures, frankly, anything, um, Bullet point two here, um, as I'm sure many are aware, there are special rules if the data falls in within the categories in the bullet points there, which is sensitive data. Um, for some reason, simply it's gonna be renamed special category data uh, from May. Um, the list isn't changing a subject, so there's two additions uh, to it on GDPR, which will be um, genetics, genetic data, and also biometric data that identifies someone. So for example, um, what um, uh, you, you may find on passports these days. So as we go forward with technology and fingerprinting and iris and so on and so forth, that will all be captured um, from, uh, from May this year. Um, and the final uh, sort of small point, the, the bottom bullet point, um, the rules on when you can process information about someone's alleged criminal offences or legal proceedings um, are changing. Um, and we don't know yet on what basis you can do that because it's under the Data Protection Bill, which is still... With the um, with UK Parliament, and so that's still going through draft. So there will be some different rules um, if 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 you come across the, the final bullet point. So uh, an example maybe insurance, where you're looking at someone's driving history. Um, there'll be extra rules as to when you can uh, process sensitive data. 
uh, the, the general rule that um, uh, is relied upon is that for sensitive data, um, you need to get the um, express consent of the individual before you do anything with it, before you collect it uh, and further process it. There are exemptions, but that's the rule of thumb. Um, an important distinction then is if you're a controller or a processor, and, and, and some, some people um, um, believe that you know, you're either a controller or a processor for life, and the reality is that that's not true because it depends on the, um, the activity that you're doing on any given piece of business. So you might find that um, uh, two uh, businesses um, for the purposes of, of what, the, of what um, the, the process is doing for the controller, so, for example, the processor may be um, uh, running their payroll for them, which is a strictly, a strictly a processing activity. But if, if, for example, also the controller says, but we're also happy to allow you to use some, some of the personal data that we're sending you for other purposes. You know, we, we don't mind you then using it for you know, maybe, maybe, maybe marketing purposes. At that point, the processor is also, for those purposes, a controller. So they're, they're acting as a processor and a controller in, in that, one, um, that one business uh, um, relationship. It's very important that that's not lost sight of because the rules are different for both. The first bullet point, then the test really, the control of the person, the, the, the organization who determines the reason, the purposes, um, which means the decision as to well, uh, why are we collecting someone's personal data, whose data are we collecting, what are we going to do with it, and also the manner. So the manner refers to the technical means um, of uh, how we then process the data, how we choose to collect it. Um, and that's something which the processors should not do. If, it, if, they, if, they, if they are involved in determining the, the purposes, then they're actually acting as a controller, um, as well as the, uh, the initial controller, and in which, in which case you have two controllers in that uh, situation. And the, law, and the law will call that generally data controllers in common, two controllers uh, in, in that respect. One thing to say is that when it comes to the manner, the regulator, the ICO, has made it very clear that because often controllers, the reason that they appoint a process is because they're relying on the expertise, the technical expertise of a processor. You know, the company knows how to um, better uh, technically process our payroll, for example. And data processors are allowed a certain degree of discretion in choosing the manner, um, uh, which means the technical means. So the manner is less of a, um, a, a, a litmus test, but the, 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 the business reason, the purposes, is absolutely can only be um, decided by the data controller. The eight principles under the Data Protection Act are not changing, um, subject to some, some minor wording changes. We'll go through these in, some of these in detail in a moment. So, um, the first uh, principle that data must be processed fairly and lawfully is, uh, consists of two tests, which we'll look at in a moment. Um, the second point. The data can only be collected for limited purposes. Again, I'm going to look at that in detail in a moment. I'd like to touch on point three. Point three is sometimes called the data minimization principle. So this means that even if you are collecting data fairly and lawfully and everything looks fine, you need to ensure that you're not collecting more personal data than is strictly necessary. So if you like the bare minimum for what you're trying to achieve, and if you go above and beyond the types of personal data you're collecting from someone, um, so it becomes um, uh, excessive, not relevant, strictly relevant to what you're trying to achieve, then that would be unlawful. Um, even if it's desirable and you'd rather have it, um, if it's not strictly necessary for the purpose and for the, and, 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 and for the lawful basis, then you can't do so. Um, and if you want to collect more than strictly necessary, then essentially you, 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 know, you need to ask for consent uh, from the uh, individual, from the data subject to do so. Principle four, there's an ongoing duty as far as you can to make sure the data is kept up to date and is accurate. This generally um, refers to a data subject right, which we'll come on to, where someone can request the data is rectified if it's not in fact accurate, and we'll look at that in a moment. Principle five, this is tied into data retention policies. So each business should have a, a policy, and from May it needs to be in writing, which sets out how long you're going to keep someone's data for. Um, where you can't specify an actual time limit because often it's very difficult to put a time limit on how long you want someone's data, or rather I should say you need the data for. GDPR, the new rules are saying that you need to, at the very least, explain the criteria 
to the individual. So what are the criteria, uh, the reason, the reason why we would say from uh, in, you know, should the following happen? For example, should you close your account uh, with us, then uh, we won't keep your data for any longer. So you need to think about the criteria for each use of um, the types of personal data that you um, that you're processing. Point six we'll look at in a moment, which will set out what are the rights of the data subject. And point seven, again, a bit more detail coming up on this. Um, this is looking at what are the measures that need to be put in place by a data controller. And going forward from May, this also applies to data processes for the first time. So both will have to have in place appropriate measures in order to protect against data being accidentally lost or destroyed or data being um, uh, disclosed um, to a third party without, uh, you know, without, with, with, um, without permission. So there needs to be a, a appropriate measures. And um, that's all the law says, so it's not a great help, although there is some guidance uh, on what are appropriate measures in certain scenarios. So for example, the ICO has guidance on cloud computing and what they consider to be appropriate for a business that either uses a cloud provider or provides um, a cloud hosting service. The eighth and final principle um, is one of the more technical ones and can be, can be tricky to understand, but in, in essence, data should not be sent outside of any country in the EEA um, unless it's sent to a country which um, is exempt because it's been, it is considered to have um, adequate data protection rules, and there is a list of such countries the ICO has available. Um, if, if data is sent outside the EEA, then, then there, needs to be, there needs to be something in place to allow that to happen legally. So for example, um, there are um, two different sets of standard contract clauses which can be added as a schedule to your contract. Those clauses are called EU model um, clauses because they are based on a precedent, a model, and they can't be changed. And they set up very standard terms between the data controller and its data processor that's outside of the EEA, or between the data controller and another data controller that's outside the EEA. So for example, if a UK controller is sharing data with um, a controller of data in India, um, and so both are uh, operating independently, in other words, the Indian business is allowed to do with the data pretty much what it chooses, um, and but the arrangement is a data sharing arrangement, um, then because those two businesses are data controllers and one's outside of the EEA, then there's a set of clauses, a standard model clauses, called the controller to controller clauses, which can be used to be attached to the, to the, to the contract between the two controllers, which will allow that to happen. And, all, and also if the controller is using um, a processor, so for example, if you're using a payroll provider who happens to be you know, based or outsourcing to India, then again, there are con uh, clauses, controller to processor clauses in that situation that can be adopted. One thing that there isn't, and the, and the EU has said for some time that they um, are going to produce these, but they haven't got around to it, um, is that there's no such clauses that allow processor of data or provider data to another processor. So, um, call a sub process contractor. So, if the payroll provider out server provider the host picks up their data. Then there's no model to, to, to send the data to another another you know. I'm just waiting for my next slide to load. Um, we're going to look at the first two tests and the first principle. And the first one I wanted to look at was if data is processed um, fairly. 
So data has to be processed fairly, and what does that mean? So this comes, this is this is something which comes um, into the territory of privacy policies, which I'm sure everyone's seen, and of course they're all over the place, and generally they're on people's web pages, and there's a link to a privacy policy. So um, the reason why privacy policies or privacy notices, and they're sometimes called fair, pro fair processing notices, exist, is because um, data controllers have to be transparent and give certain information to um, the data subject, to the, into the individual. Um, and the law says you, that you should only do with people's data what they reasonably expect. Now, if you were going to do something which they would not reasonably expect, then it needs to be set out in the privacy notice, um, and you may well find you have to ask for consent. Um, even if you are doing something which is perfectly within the reasonable expectation of the person who's, data, who, who's giving you their data, um, it's expected that you would always, in any event, provide a privacy notice, um, a privacy policy. And the third bullet point sets out what that has to consist of, which is only three things at the moment, which is the processing purposes. So you have to tell people why you're collecting their data and what you're going to do with it. You have to give the identity of the, of the data controller um, and any other information that's needed to ensure fairness, which is very, very broad, quite a woolly um, uh, um, requirement. The bottom bullet point there, the code of practice available on the website from the ICO does, however, give useful practical examples um, of um, what other information should be provided in a privacy notice. The GDPR is making huge, um, huge changes here, introducing very um, substantially uh, longer list of things that have to be provided and detail that have to be provided to um, uh, to the data subject. Um, and so one of the tasks that all businesses now are facing is having to rewrite the, uh, their, their privacy policies to, um, to provide that extra information. The, um, the uh, penultimate bullet point must, says must be provided before or at the time. So a privacy policy has to be provided or available before the data is collected. Sometimes you'll see a link saying, before you send the data, please click here if you're interested in our privacy policy. And that's making the, um, the policy available. Sometimes that's not enough and you have to go further and actually flag it up to people. So you might find on an online platform where you're collecting information from someone that a box pops up in which you actually bring into the attention the policy. And the situations when you need to do so there's, there's got, there, there, there's, there is guidance as to when you need to be sort of proactive in, in, in bringing it up, um, which again is another sort of subject we could discuss at length today, but just to be aware of the, the basic principles uh, in terms of fair processing information um, by way of a privacy notice or a privacy policy. The second test is that the data has to be processed lawfully, which means you have to identify legal ground under the, um, the Act. Again, these are not changing. GDPR again, keeps the same legal the same legal grounds. Unless you're a public body, then the first three will cover 90% of your business. And it's the first three bullets there that uh, will, will be relevant. So the first bullet point is, is the easiest to use because it's usually the most um, obvious one, which is, well, we need your data, otherwise we can't provide you with these services. Or we can't provide you. We can't provide you with our goods. So if it's necessary, then you don't need consent. That's your basis of processing. This test also usefully also usefully covers off situations where um, a consumer, for example, requests information on someone's product. Um, you, of course, can then send you can you can then send them the information, and in doing so, you can collect their personal data because you're going to need their contact details for all that. And that would also be necessary, even though they haven't strictly yet signed up to the contract. So it also includes a request for, um, as it were, pre-contract uh, a request for uh, goods and services. The second and third bullet points: if it's not necessary um, to, in, in order to provide your um, goods and services, then you, you're normally going to come down to well. Um, are we going to rely on, on getting their consent, or can we say it's in our legitimate interests? And, and, and there's always a, um, a choice between those two, generally speaking. Um, consent is something which is changing vastly under GDPR. And one of the changes is that where, at the moment, businesses very often just rely on consent 
um, they ask for consent. Um, it's the easy thing to do if you like. You don't have to consider the legitimate interests because legitimate interest involves a bit of a balancing act between are our commercial interests um, greater than um, the impact it would have on the person. So consent is easy, but because of that, re for, for that reason, it's being used too much is what the, um, the regulators have, have uh, concluded. And so all, all controllers now need to re reconsider whether it's still appropriate to rely on consent. And for example, if you ask for consent, but if the person didn't give that to you, if you if your if if your conclusion was well, we're still going to do it because actually we can probably do it because it's in our legitimate interest, or or we need their data anyway for the service, then that would mean that asking for consent would no longer be legal, because it's not true. You're not giving someone the true choice if you're going to do it anyway under another ground. So that's a really big change. Is just looking at the the uh, the, the grounds on which um you are processing data and one thing to note here is that this is not um one of these legal grounds will not necessarily cover all of the processing so the purpose for which you are collecting and using data has to be linked to a ground so for example we're collecting payment data because we need it to fulfill our service that's that's, that's the first bullet point if you then want to also use someone's data to send out marketing well that's not strictly necessary for the contract performance so you need to look at then whether is actually a legitimate interest or, or whether you're getting consent um, for marketing. So you need to look at each different re uh, use of data and tie one legal basis to each. And that's a very big task going forward because GDP GDPR requires um, data controllers to, for the first time, to document um, their reasonings um, so that the, um, the, the, the information is available to the regulator if they then contact and say we can we just check your data protection uh, your records and you would be obliged to at least be able to show that you've given thought to the basis on which you're processing a data for a particular purpose you can't sort of think of the think, think of the reasoning after the event so you have to this is something you have to do for the first time in advance um, and the other reason for that is because the new um, privacy policy um, fair fairness uh, requirements mean that the privacy policy also has to tell the data subject now um, before you collect their data um, what your legal basis is and why so there's much more transparency required going forward um, and much more thought before um, you start to pr process data um, than, than there has been for the last uh, 20 years the, the final bullet point we touched upon this sensitive data generally speaking you need to get explicit consent before you can process it and that's in addition to one of the uh, legal basis above. Now, if you're relying on consent, then of course you can rely on consent, as you can see in the first, uh, in, in the in the top bullet points, the legal basis consent. Um, and so we need to get consent for sensitive data anyway, so we'll use consent. But you may find other situations where, for example, um, the um, in, in the uh, in, uh, HR departments, um, sensitive data can be processed if it's part of um, exercising an em employment rights, and you don't need consent for that, for example. So. Uh, that's the other classic um, exemption to consent is that you can rely on um, exercising um, either employment duties as an employer um, or enforcing um, an em the employment rights of an individual without having to get their um, explicit consent uh, signed up to before you uh, before you process their data. The second principle, um, so we touched on this. You need to be clear up front now what, what you're collecting and why you're, why you're doing it. Um, and that needs to now be in the privacy notice. Um, if you then want to change the purpose for which you originally collected the data, you want to do something else with it. The question will then be, do you need to notify the individual? You may not need to get their consent, but you certainly need to notify them. So that, that involves refreshing, updating your privacy policy. The third bullet point is that there's also a duty on the data controllers to notify the ICO, the regulator, with their details. And the ICO has a public register you can search, which sets out um, the purposes for which any business collects and processes data. And of course, if what you tell people in your privacy notice is not the same as what the ICO have, then um, you, you need to review that because clearly that could be um, problematic. Um, it's just a question of updating. Uh, if you want to um, move beyond the, the purpose for which the data was collected. 
The most common example of this generally is when you're going to share data with another uh, organization and that was not originally envisaged. And you may, you may in fact have said in your notice to people, well, we won't share your data, in which case clearly you need to update them. And in fact, if you've said, if you've, if you've said you won't specifically collect, um, share their data and now you're going to, then you'd also need to get their consent before doing so. So the final bullet point is a summary. Is the, um, is the new um, purpose um, compatible with what you've already told people? Um, and the litmus test there is, if, for example, the privacy policy wording is not very clear and you're not sure if it's the same purpose, ask yourself, well, is it within the reasonable expectation of that individual? Would they reasonably object? Would they find this you know, a strange use of data? And if the answer is no, they wouldn't, then it's likely to be compatible and it's unlikely you need to then um, inform uh, the, uh, the individual of the new uh, use of, of data. Data subjects' rights are changing quite considerably. At the moment, we have these six rights. Subject access request, that's the, um, that's the uh, right everyone has to send in um, a request in writing and pay 10 pounds, <laughs> which is the current law, uh, although the 10 pound firm phrase being waived, um, to um, ask for a copy of their data. At the moment, you can then respond, you can send out to information in any form you choose, essentially, provided it's legible. Um, going forward, if the request is made electronically, which um, of course it often will be, say by email, um, you need, you'll need to provide that data also electronically. So you have to ensure that you can export the data readily in an electronic format to provide um, personal data to, um, to um, an individual. There's also a similar right coming in under GDPR, which complements this. So an additional right, which is called data portability. And in some situations that allows the, sub, um, uh, um, the subject, the, 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 the individual to request that you send a copy of their data electronically to another service provider. For example, they might want to change their bank and they want their account records sent to their new bank. Um, if they make that request, then the data controller has to comply. Um, so you have to be able to send um, uh, electronic copy to the new service provider. And the format of that has to be in a commonly used, commonly understood um, um, uh, format, a CSV file or, or what have you. So this is really a question of making sure that you can get hold of someone's data quickly um, that, you, that, that you are processing, so you know where it is in your organization and export it readily in, in an electronic format. So that's going forward uh, from May the 25th. The second, Right. This has only been a right which has been, which which has um, involved having to get a court order to um, put right data that's inaccurate. Going forward, the court order is not going to be required, and people can contact you to request that you put right data which they believe is inaccurate. Um, that is um, complemented by what's called a right to suppress data under GDPR. So. That means you have to stop processing if someone contacts you and objects on certain grounds. And on those grounds, if they say that their data is inaccurate, you have to stop processing it, which means you have to um, do nothing more than simply hold on to it uh, whilst you're looking, whilst um, the data is being reviewed to see if it's accurate or not. So there needs to be an ability to put um, to cease any processing beyond just holding the data if, if someone makes, a, makes that request. The third right is not. The third right has never really been used very much, um, very difficult to prove, and, and that's going um, in that form. So we won't, we won't um, spend any time on, on, on point three. Point four is very important. There's no changes really here. Um, you can send out marketing to individuals, and of course, if they contact to say, please stop, then you have to stop. And that right remains. Um, so that's the opt-out uh, right um, under the Data Protection Act. Well, that's important to note. There are separate, very important rules outside of the DPA and outside of GDPR. And these are under the e-privacy regulations, which means that um, in some cases, you need to get specific consent before you send out direct marketing. So it's not enough to allow someone to opt out in the future, but you actually have to get their opt-in permission before you do so. And that essentially relates to sending out marketing um, by email and text um, or, or automated phone calls. And if that's sent to individuals rather than to businesses, then the rules, the rules are not changing. You'll need to get specific consent before you do so. 
The only one change to the rules is that because consent is changing so much under GDPR, going forward, um, you will have to have evidence that someone has proactively opted in. In other words, they've taken a step to say yes, and the, the most obvious way is to have a blank tick box and not a pre ticked box that someone ticks yes to receive um, electronic marketing. The fifth point, automated decision making is being expanded upon. This is any decision that's made without human involvement. So machine learning, AI that processes data, and then something happens as a result, for example, automated generated marketing, marketing lists. The other, big, the other example is profiling. So machines that can track user behavior on websites. Automated decision making, including profiling, are also uh, in GDPR um, included. Um, and they're not prohibited, but there are certain grounds on which you can only do this. Um, and we'll look at that in more detail the next uh, webinar, which looks at GDPR um, in a couple of weeks. The right to compensation is not changing. That's um, the right to um, um, ask court to um, order that you uh, data controller pays compensation for a breach. The key change, though, is that that's now going to also include a right to compensation against the data processor from May the 25th. An example of some measures which um, the which we commonly which we commonly come across which are um, acceptable um, examples. I'll leave you to suggest the next two slides um, on your own. Um, they are quite self-explanatory, but this is just an idea of what measures you should consider putting in place to comply with the requirements um, to prevent data being unlawfully disclosed or destroyed, damaged or lost. Um, the uh, only point I'd like to make is the final bullet point we, over human error is often overlooked and actually the way that staff are trained um, and, and particularly if you can prove that you've trained staff so you've got records of, of that if there's a human error which is often a, a for, uh, and often a, a reason for a breach um, the businesses need to protect themselves you need to protect yourself by having um, records that you've trained that member of staff and yet you know that despite that they've in the example there they've um, misaddressed a letter post it's gone to the wrong people, which is a data breach. If that's an unlawful disclosure, someone's information has gone to another person. Or a member of staff on the telephone uh, gives away information about a customer without checking first that the person calling is entitled to the information. So, for example, a police officer or the customer themselves, for that matter. So verification of identification um, uh, as an example. And then just a few more um, examples there of um, things to consider. Uh, as, as appropriate measures. Um, data processor agreements, the, 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 the bullet on the left at the bottom, um, that's actually um, a, a contract between a controller and a processor. There is a legal requirement that, that, that that's in place and from under GDPR there's specific things that have to be in that contract. So that one there actually is not a, um, a nice to have or an option that's that's a, that's a mandatory requirement that you have to have a contract in place before data is processed and there's also a few key examples of what um, you we would expect uh, your employees to be trained on and to to appear in policies so you'd have a for example an acceptable user policy an IT policy and they were containing the this kind of advice so this is an idea this is an example of an organizational measure to guard against uh, data breaches um, and we would expect um, that, um, I'll say we, but the regulator, shall we say, if there was a problem, they would expect that your staff had been trained and been told that, that measures such as those appearing here um, should be in place. And if they're not in place or you can't prove that they're in place, then you might find that the regulator says, well, you don't have enough organizational measures in place. And that's irrespective of how good your IT security is, you may have amazing encryption. But if you don't have these other measures in place organizationally, so it's sort of non-technical, um, then you would probably be found not to have um, complied with the Data Protection Act um, in terms of um, essentially um, the, the, the human, allowing for the, the human error, as it were. Um, so it's very important uh, that um, if you don't yet have policies in place which are in writing uh, and proof of training to employees that you do so um, before May the 25th. This is just really just a, um, a summary of, um, of, of what's coming up in the next um, seminar and on some of the things that we've touched upon, so the key changes here. So as I explained, the same principles are, are, um, apply, although they are strengthened. 
um, accountability. Again, this means that going forward, you're now going to have to be able to prove that you've complied with the app, which means you have to keep internal records. You have to make sure that your policies and processes are also in writing. It's, it's one thing to do something, but you need to record and show you do it. So you, what, if, is your information breach policy, is that in writing? Is your staff training uh, in writing? Have you got records of that? Do you have records of whether data leaves the, um, the, the EEA or not? So there are record keeping requirements for both processes and controllers of data going forward. And accountability is really a big change because it's very much proving that you do what you say you do. Um, and so there's a lot of, a lot of tasks um, on both controllers and processes now ahead of May in terms of internal governance and internal record keeping. The ICO does have some useful templates on their website, for example, for um, in, Excel, in Excel form for um, how they may expect to see you uh, recording um, what your processing activities are, whether you're a, whether you're a controller or a processor. Um, we can also provide assistance, and, uh, of course, and, and, uh, and, and point you in the direction of the, of the precedents that the ICO produce, uh, as a starting point, if you wish, but you, um, all businesses will need to have a certain level of records going forward, uh, whether they're controllers or processors. The third point, so I've touched upon some of the expansion of existing rights um, going forward, and there's more detail coming up in the next um, uh, webinar. Breach reporting. Um, changes here is that um, as well as the data controller having to consider whether they need to tell the ICO if there's been a breach, the data processor will now have to proactively tell the data controller if they're aware of anything um, at their end. Um, and so the data processes need to be um, equally mindful of having a system to monitor potential breaches um, so they can then report to the controller of data. Um, and lastly, the, the data controllers now also have to consider for the first time also directly reporting to the individuals um, affected. So that's another new thing that's coming in is um, uh, whether we need to tell people that we're aware that something with their data has, has gone awry. And there is some guidance again on this subject from the EU available um, from the ICO website giving some more practical guidance on when that applies. Data protection officers which is a role that an, um, a named individual um, uh, will play essentially to keep an eye on the business's compliance so one of your own employees often it's an IT or a CTO a member of staff that who's tasked partly with uh, making sure that uh, staff are trained and that we're compliant and keeping an eye on, or keeping an eye on any breaches. Um, the occasion where you have to have a DPO going forward is limited, but essentially if you're carrying out extensive and large scale processing of data, then it's mandatory to have a DPO appointed. And we can advise you on that, of course, um, separately. And one thing to note is useful is you, you, can, you can outsource this. You could have someone outsourced. Um, for example, uh, you know, it could be, a, could be a, 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 a law firm, for example, you can outsource the DPO role. Impact assessments, um, again, um, when, where a DPO is required, again, for the activities which are um, large scale, for example, large scale online profiling, an impact assessment, which is essentially a risk assessment, will also be in some cases required before you commence, uh, before you commence with, uh, with that activity. And the last point, um, the penalties are going up. So the worst case scenario when things go wrong is that the uh, £500,000 fine which is the maximum uh, now for breaches of data protection law are going up to 20 million euros or 4% of global turnover. And that equally applies to data processors for the first time. So it's not only controllers of data who face fines for getting things, uh, for getting things wrong. Um, and, that's, um, and, that's, uh, and that's it. So thanks very much for your attendance. As you see, um, the, the next um, more detailed GDPR um, webinar is coming up uh, on the 28th, and we're very happy to see you there. Um, in the meantime, um, I'll review uh, questions that have come in, um, and we will circulate the answer to that to everyone who's attended, together with a copy of the slides. What I can say is thank you very much for your time, and I, and I, hope, uh, I hope no one had technical issues, um, and all could hear and see clearly, but, um, Thanks very much.